this series with a look at Battleship and how sometimes uh, we play Battleship in our real life in a quest for who's right and who's wrong. And we like to fire torpedoes back and forth at each other in arguments, hoping that one of them lands. And then it's just a matter of time before we sink our opponent and we are once again proven to be right only at the expense of a relationship. And that is, that is not good. And last week we saw how God tells us to just stop it, stop arguing, stop worrying about who's right and who's wrong in 2 Timothy 2. And we can just stop stupid arguments. We don't have to be right, we can just disagree with one another. And many times the most heated arguments in the church are are over the stupidest things, and we need to cut it out. I got some feedback from my sermon last week, actually this morning. Uh, We looked at one of the dumbest things the church argues about, and one church was arguing about whether it was okay or not to serve deviled eggs. And we said only, only if it was paired with angel food cake. So we had a, a, a person told me today she was looking for angel food cake yesterday at the supermarket so she could bring her deviled eggs at, at, uh, at church today. So I found that pretty funny. Um, but it's true. We, we, we don't need to argue over silly things in the church. And, and God's word even, even calls them stupid. We, we don't have to argue about stupid things because that doesn't lead to unity. We can just agree to disagree, and, and we moved on from, from stupid arguments to arguments that are important to us, matters of our conscience. What happens when, when, when we're dealing with those things, things that, 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 that maybe my conscience will allow, but somebody else's won't? How, how do we do that within the church? And we looked at these areas that we would call disputable matters in the church, and actually Paul talks about disputable matters in, in Romans 14, the entire chapter is dedicated to, to these ideas of, 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 of things that we um, would do or wouldn't do based upon our conscience. In Paul's day, it was pretty much about food, that people would argue what's right and what's wrong to eat. And the reason is because Jews and Gentiles were thrust together for the first time. And Gentiles ate all kinds of food, and Jews ate only certain food. So there was all this argument over what food was right to eat, and Paul talked a lot about how you shouldn't argue about these things, about these disputable matters, but instead encourage one another to hold on to their conscience. And and in Christian love, don't ask someone to violate their conscience. So if if a Gentile family invited a a Jewish family over for dinner, one of the rudest things they would do is serve them a ham because Jews probably would have a strong conviction against eating ham. They would want to feed them something that would be uh, in, in line with what their conscience is telling them is right to do. And in our churches today, we still have areas of disputable matters, and we talked about all kinds of things like alcohol or tattoos or, or movies or Bible translations, worship styles. We talked about all these things last week, and we said we're not to argue about these things, but rather let each believer hold on tight to their conscience and their convictions and don't encourage them to, to let go of those things. At the same time, if you have a strong conviction against something, we shouldn't be judging our, our brother or sister because their conscience is telling them something different. And these are, these are not issues where God's word clearly lays out that something is right or wrong, like murder or stealing. I, I can't say that. Uh, Tony, my conscience tells me that stealing isn't wrong, so I'm going to borrow that truck of yours for the rest of my life. That, that's not okay, but there are areas that, 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 that people can, can, ha- can hold a strong line on one way or the other, and we need to let each other obey our conscience and not worry about who's right and who's wrong. And this week, we're going to look at a different game, and that game is Clue. Clue! You guys remember that game? Clue? It was kind of like the first uh, mystery murder game that there was, and the whole purpose of the game is to find out who killed the game's victim, right? The librarian in the, in, the, in the kitchen with a knife. I think that's how it kind of went. Does anyone here like Clue? Anyone play Clue? Okay, yeah, okay. We have some Clue lovers out there. I did not like playing Clue. I never won at a game of Clue, which is probably why I didn't like it. Um, so I was not a big Clue fan, but essentially what Clue is is a blame game. You're trying to assess blame. Who's to blame for the murder? And this is fun to do in a game, but it's not okay to do in our real lives. As we're, we're looking at who's to blame. You see, when we play the blame game, we are throwing someone else under the bus, attempting to avoid taking responsibility for our own actions, and that's not okay. We do not want to play the blame game in real life, but unfortunately, we've been playing this game from the very beginning of creation. We've been playing the blame game, not willing to take accountability for our actions. Look what, look what uh, uh, the, first crea- the first creation did when God asked them why they ate the fruit here in Genesis 3, verses 6 through 13. 
This is what it says. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig, fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and, the wo- and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. Then the Lord called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me. It was the woman you gave, who gave the fruit to me, and I ate it. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So here, Look at what Adam says when he is questioned about eating the fruit. It was the woman, God. Okay, women in here, uh, you know, more specifically wives, have you ever been in this situation? Huh? I, I see some elbows going, right? Like, like, like maybe hers. I, I would have been here on time, but my wife took 45 minutes to figure out what pair of shoes she wanted to wear. You know women. But really, you just didn't want to turn off the game or come in from fishing, right? Right? But you want to place that blame. Doctor, I would eat healthier, but I can only eat what my wife cooks for dinner. It's her fault that I'm so out of shape. It's not my fault, Doc. But, but really, it's the bacon, donuts, and Reese's that I sneak all day long, right? Now, those are just two examples of my own marriage. Now, Adam tries to throw his wife under the, bu- under the bus. It's her fault that I ate the fruit, God. But not only is Adam so bold as to throw his wife under the bus, but look what he also says. It was a woman that you gave me, God. He is throwing God under the bus. He is trying to blame God for his own actions. This is not okay. It's a very bold thing to do, but it's not okay. He's trying to blame God. You know, God, I was doing just fine until you gave me that woman, which I'm sure during this exchange, Eve is giving Adam the look right now, right? Like, excuse me, what? What are you saying right now? I'm sure, men, you you know the look, right? Adam didn't want to take responsibility. He wanted to blame somebody else. And Eve wasn't much better. She blamed the serpent. It was the serpent's fault. That's why I ate it. But no one forced them to eat the fruit. The the woman wasn't forced to eat the fruit. Adam wasn't forced to eat the fruit. They both chose to do it. And they both did not want to take responsibility for their actions. And if we want to avoid playing Clue in our real lives, avoid playing the blame game, there are two things we need to do today. First is take responsibility. Take responsibility, own your mistakes, own your sins, instead of blaming other people for them. And when we, when we try to throw people under the bus, we're avoiding what is wrong with us, with our hearts, and trying to turn the attention on to somebody else. And I understand it's not easy to take responsibility, because we come out of the womb playing the blame game. It's not something someone taught us, it's something that came natural with our fallen state. Anyone who has raised kids knows all too well how to wade through the blame game. At our house, sometimes a situation will arise, Isla, hit me! The first question we ask that kid is, what did you do? Nothing. Oh, she just went up and walloped you for no reason? Yes. Okay, I don't think so. I don't think so. Or or another instance, this, this happens all the time, we'll assess one of our kids to pick up the computer room. That's their hangout area, and they leave messes in there all the time. And usually what happens is, is I will go in there and I say, well, why didn't you clean up the mess? Oh, that's Forrest's mess. That's not my mess. Well, that mess was there when I asked you to clean the computer room. I know, I didn't make that mess, though, Dad. That was Forrest's mess that he made. So he's always trying to assess blame or, or an excuse why we didn't really do what we were supposed to do. And, and it's fun to, to think as parents about these little, little things going on with our kids, but it's not so funny when we do it as adults, especially when it goes on in our homes, in our places of work, and within the church. When we fail to take responsibility for our actions and try to throw someone else under the bus, there are real relational consequences. There just are. There are relational consequences when we're not willing to own our own mistakes. I've seen marriages come to screeching halts because they're playing the blame game. It's my husband's fault that our marriage is in the situation. Is No, 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 it's my wife's fault. And I've seen people get divorced simply because they're not willing to take responsibility for their own actions. I've seen people leave churches because someone didn't want to take responsibility for their actions and threw them under the bus, playing the blame game. God's Word 
tells us to own our mistakes, to take responsibility for our own actions. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces finds mercy. Every one of us in here needs to hear this wisdom today. Every one of us. We need to take responsibility for our lives and for our sins. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. Whoever confesses, find mercy. Who here finds this true in your life? When you confess, you find mercy. All right, it's true in our children's lives. We try to, te- we try to teach our kids to speak truth because if you lie to us, the consequences are going to be way worse, way more severe than if you just would have owned your mistake to begin with. Who here, husbands, find that your marriages are much more pleasant when you're owning up to your own mistakes and willing to ask forgiveness? Honey, that bag of Oreos that went missing last night, that was my fault. After you went to bed, I snuck out in the living room and ate the whole bag, and I tried to blame it on the dog. It was my fault. Please don't punish the dog. Becky's not here right now, so don't tell her about the Oreos. That <laughs> but it, it, is, it is important that we humble ourselves and, and, and have a willingness to admit that we were wrong. And this played out in a real way in the life of a young man on a Little League baseball team in, in, in the home city of where, of where I was at in California. And uh, this, this Little Leaguer here was, was playing second base. And to set up the scene, he was a second baseman. There was a runner on first base, and there's a kid up to bat, and he hits the ball to third base. So the runner that was on first base is running to second. The second baseman goes to cover the bag, and... He, he catches the ball, and the runner is called out. In the Little League games, there's only usually one ump, so he can't see everything. And the kid actually ran up to the umpire and said, look, the, the runner isn't out. I, my foot came off of the bag, and I, I want to be honest with you, right? To which his teammates were razzing him and all this. What are you doing? You, you know, it was, you got called out. You just, just let it go. He goes, I can't let it go. My foot came off of the bag. I, I, I wanted to let him know. And, and to fast forward a, a few more games, that same ump is, is umping another game with this kid, and, the, and this kind of the same scenario happens, uh, uh, only, only in reverse. The kid, the kid goes to cover second base, and the, the base runner is called safe this time because the ump said, your foot came off the bag. And the kid was walking back to his position with his head held low. I said, keep your head up. It's only, it's only one mistake. He goes, no, my, my foot didn't come off the bag this time. That, that runner should have been out. And the ump went to the other manager and said, look, I've got to call this kid out now because the second baseman is the most honest kid I've ever met. And, and, and the manager said, you know what, I understand. He, he, he's out. And he went out and got the kid off of second base. And the reason the manager didn't, didn't protest the call is because word spread around this little league about the honesty and integrity of this little kid's word two or three games ago. That, that he was willing to own his mistakes, even when all of his friends, even when all of his teammates would, 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 you know, say things about him, he was willing to stand up and take responsibility for his actions. And when we're known as a people that take responsibility for our actions, becomes a defining characteristic is in who you are. You know what? When, 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 when John says he messed up, he messed up. He's not, he is not going to pass the blame onto somebody else. But the same can be true of our lives and our character if we're always blaming other people. When we're not willing to take responsibility for our actions and we're always blaming other people, you can't be, you're not going to be someone that can be trusted. You're not going to be someone that's looked upon very favorably among your brothers and sisters. So I want to encourage you to take responsibility for your actions. And the second thing we can do today, if we're going to overcome the blame game, the second thing we can do is this. Send, receive, repeat. Send, receive, repeat, and this has nothing to do with email, okay? This has nothing to do with email. It has everything to do with how you handle situations within the church when somebody sins against you, when somebody hurts you in the church. Now, this may come as a surprise. Why would anybody hurt me in the church? Why, why would the church ever hurt me? Well, we live in a fallen world. There are no perfect people, which means there are no perfect churches, and occasionally, sometimes, you will get hurt. And Jesus tells us what we need to do in those situations. When somebody hurts us, whether they do it intentionally or unintentionally, Jesus gives us a pattern as to how to solve that equation, what we need to do. And he says we need to send, we need to receive, and we need to repeat. And these instructions are found in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15. This is the first step. If another believer sins against you, Go privately and point out the offense 
If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Now, Jesus gives this very specific teaching when someone wrongs us in the church. The first thing we do is go privately. Go privately and point out the offense. This is the send part of the command. We must go privately. Imagine how many relationships could be saved, reconciled in the church, if we just would have gone privately to address the offense. But many times when someone offends us, sins against us in the church, it becomes public knowledge pretty quickly. Sometimes all too quickly, and it ends up on Facebook and Twitter for all our friends to see. And that's not okay. That is not what Christ commands us to do. When we are wrong, we go privately to the person that wronged us. We don't go around to everybody else telling everyone else how that person has wronged us. And I am guilty of this offense. Very guilty. All right? When someone has wronged me, I've gone to other people first. I wanted to be justified in my own mind that, that yeah, I was wrong. I wanted them to know that I was wrong. Now, I never put it out on Facebook, okay? I let Facebook be for what Facebook is supposed to be for, people posting beautiful stories of bacon on my timeline. And I, I want to thank, hey, it happens almost weekly. I thank you. I like that. That's good. But it's not good when we're not willing to go privately to whoever hurt us and speak to them one-on-one -on -one to say, hey, look, you hurt me, and, and I want you to know that you hurt me. Just think how nice it would be if we could just do that privately and reconcile the relationship now when someone comes to you you need to be willing to receive okay i know right this is going to be fun right this is fun you need to listen to the one who you wronged and listen to what you did that hurt them all right you need to receive that in your life i know this is a tough pill to swallow but if you've wronged someone you need to receive that husbands have you ever asked your wives why they're so upset right honey why are you upset you know why I'm upset. No, I don't know what I did to upset you. Why? So I'm asking you to tell me what I did to upset you. Know, you know, we, we may not know what we did to upset someone else, but when someone comes to us and says, you upset me, even if you didn't mean to, even if you didn't know you upset them, you need to receive that correction in your life. And when you do as Jesus instructs, when you listen and ask for forgiveness, when you receive it and ask for forgiveness and confess that you're sorry, there, there, there is a blueprint that Jesus has given us for reconciliation in the church. This is how reconciliation happens in the church, is we go and sin privately, and then we receive the correction, we ask for forgiveness, and reconciliation happens. Unfortunately, that's not the way it happens all the time in the church. We don't follow this blueprint very well, because what happens is, even if we're bold enough to go to that person, tell them what they've done, and if they don't basically try to heal the relationship, we, we tend just to say, oh, well, it didn't my fault. Uh, Jesus told me to go. I'm done. But actually, in the Greek, that word go, that means continually go. Don't just do it once. Continually go to your brother or sister who wronged you and try to get reconciliation. Hence the repeat. Send, receive, repeat as much as you can to try to get that relationship healed. Now, unfortunately, things don't always go right. Things don't, you know, th that person may not be willing to try to make things right. And maybe a person, in this case, if the person is continually sinning against you, okay, if it's a one-time offense and they won't say they're sorry, or, okay. But if they're continually sinning against you, let's say someone is slandering me behind my back, and I hear about it, and I go to that person one-on-one -on -one and say, Look, I can't have you talking about me this way. This is not okay. This is not healthy for the church. I'm not saying that's going on, but just use that as an example. And, and they don't want to listen, and they're slandering me, and I go back to them and say, look, you're still doing it. I need you to stop. And, and if they're still doing it, if they're still slandering me behind my back, Jesus says there's something else we can do. This is what he says in verse 16 of Matthew 18. He says, but if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Now, the whole purpose of the witnesses are not for ganging up on someone and forcing them into the repentance, okay? It's not like Spider-Man gets the Avengers and they all swoop in and, you know, hold you down until you say you're sorry. The point of these witnesses is to act as a mediator, is to be counsel there for both sides, to try to listen and work out and bring about reconciliation, okay? That's the whole point of this, is to bring about reconciliation. 
But if that doesn't work, okay, if these two or three witnesses can't bring about reconciliation, that person is continuing to sin against somebody in the church. Jesus, Jesus goes further there in Matthew 18, verse 17. He says, if they still refuse to listen, to tell, tell it to the church, now you make it public, okay? This is, this is the part of you're going public. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. And you may be looking at this verse for the first time going, man, Jesus, that escalated kind of quickly. What, what, wait a second here. How, 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 now, how is that part of reconciliation? What, what is that all about? Because when I, when I first read these for a lot of years, when I read this, I, I thought, well, that just means that you throw them out of the church. You, they're done. We're done with you. But I recently heard this uh, uh, from a different perspective and understanding why Jesus said, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And this is the point. How does Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? With love, okay? With love. What you're doing here is you're identifying them not as a brother or a sister, but as someone who needs to be reconciled back to God. And that's the whole point. They no longer need to be reconciled to a brother or sister because they're not a brother or sister. Because Jesus is saying, look, if your actions are so vile, if you are so just willing to sin against someone again and again and again, and you won't even listen to the church, Everyone in the church says, look, what you're doing is wrong and destructive to this relationship. Jesus is saying you can't view them as a brother or sister in Christ because they're not. They're still lost. And you need to get them reconciled back to God so their hearts are right with God. And then they can be made right with a brother or sister in the church. You see, this is not about not loving someone. This is about loving them enough to bring them back into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you today that without repentance... You cannot come into a right relationship with God, and we cannot come into right relationships with one another without full, I mean, full reconciliation. You can forgive someone that doesn't ask for forgiveness, but to really be right with them relationally, it takes that step of being willing to ask for forgiveness. And that is what we are called to do. We have been given this ministry of reconciliation in the church. We've been told, don't play the blame game. Actually, you need to be reconciling people back to God and reconciling people to one another. That is the ministry that Jesus has given us. And it's up to us if we're going to take seriously that ministry. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19, this is what Paul writes. He says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and get this, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God gave you and me the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And I'm here to tell you today that reconciliation begins when we stop playing the blame game and owning our own transgressions and coming to repentance before God and before one another. Let us as members of Christ's body own our mistakes. Be willing to ask for forgiveness when someone comes to us and says, you know what, John, when you said that the other day at the meeting, I was really hurt by that. And I need to receive that and say, you know what, I am sorry. I I do not want to hurt you. I will never say that again. That's the way reconciliation works. When someone comes to you with a grievance, you need to be willing to to listen and to receive that and to ask for forgiveness rather than say, well, you know what, actually, I said that at the meeting because Tony was elbowing me and it's really Tony's fault because, you know, Tony likes to elbow, so... I can't, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask for forgiveness. No, we have to be willing to own our mistakes, ask for forgiveness, and come back into a right relationship with one another. And today, I know this is not an easy teaching to hear. It's not a fun teaching to hear, but it's so necessary for us if we're going to really strive and move forward as a church and move towards unity and love. Because too many times in the church, when somebody wrongs us, what happens? We run. We run. We find another church. We, we, we want to we go somewhere else. And that's not what Christ has called us to do. When, when someone has wronged you in the church, you need to be bold enough to go to them privately and to work out your differences and to come back in right relationship with one another. That's what God desires from his church. That's what Christ desires from his bride, which is us. 
And I think we need to take his teaching seriously enough to, to, to apply it to our lives. And like I said, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I fail miserably at this. I, I don't like confrontation more than anybody else does. But sometimes that needs to happen in our lives for us to be in a right relationship with each and every member of this church. And I just want to encourage you to take seriously this teaching of Jesus today and apply it to your lives. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for even the tough teachings in Scripture, even the teachings that we hear and go, man, I don't know if I can do that, God. I am just so bad at confrontation. God, I pray that you would give us power through your Spirit to go to someone that may have wronged us. Maybe it happened 10 years ago, and we're still angry about it. God, let us go and let us try to reconcile that relationship. Let us get rid of all bitterness in our lives towards one another, God, and let us forgive And God, when necessary, God, let us ask for that forgiveness from one another. If we have said something or done something, uh, whether we intended to do it or not, Father, let us be a people that wants to to live in right relationships with one another, that wants to take responsibility for our actions, and let us not cast blame uh, upon one another, but let us just be a people that desires to do your will. God, let us be a people that, like it says there, that, that, that wants to bring about reconciliation between everyone who is lost and south, and let us, let, us, let, us, let us do our part to bring them back to the Lord. And Father, again, if there's someone in here that has um, been hurt, God, by the church, by someone in the church, let them go privately, maybe even today, and let them work out their differences, God. And as they go, God, let, let the person that, that needs to listen, God, receive that news with just a clarity of thought and, 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 a, and a spirit of, of humility, willing to repent. And Father, for all the times that I've just messed up and blown it in this situation, God, I pray for my own forgiveness, for times that I've harbored grudges and not willing to go. And Father, just empower me to, to, to do this in my own life. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to invite the worship team up here right now, because maybe there's someone in here that hasn't been reconciled back to God. Maybe there's someone in here that's never given their life to Jesus Christ and, and said, I want to I pray for forgiveness of my sins, and I want to I want to put my trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and be right with God. We can do that right now during the singing of this song. I would like to invite everyone to please stand and sing this together. Lord, I need you.